I'm Roger Misso, and this is How to Lose an Election. Welcome, everybody, uh, to the second episode of How to Lose an Election. I'm honored today to be joined by a good friend of mine, Tedra Cobb, who was the Democratic nominee for Congress in New York's 21st Congressional District in 2018 and 2020. One of the things that they don't tell you before you become a candidate for Congress is that you're probably going to meet other candidates for Congress. Uh, and I got the chance to meet Tedra when we were on our way back from Washington, D.C., we were sitting next to each other on the plane uh, and just had a great conversation. Uh, one of, I think, the best people uh, running for Congress in the country in 2020, and she is something of a neighbor of mine. Uh, if you don't know New York 21, it is literally the northern expanse, the north country of upstate New York. It is a giant district, 17,000 square miles. Uh, it takes upwards of five or six hours to get from one corner of the district down to the other. So uh, Tedra had her work cut out for her. She's a fantastic candidate running in a tough race. Uh, Tedra, number one, thank you for being here. And then number two, our first question, I always like to start off by asking, can you describe for us who you were before you became a candidate for public office? All right. Well, first and foremost, I want to say thank you. And the blessing of running for Congress is really the meeting people, meeting people like you, meeting my neighbors, not only in St. Lawrence County, that's where I'm from in Canton, but, but throughout Northern New York. And now I have relationships with people that I, I wouldn't have had if I had not run for Congress. That is a gift. You are a gift and our friendship is a gift. So I just want to start out with that. Um, I'm the same person. Uh, my background here has been in healthcare, in community service. Uh, I'm already being involved again. I'm delivering meals for the Office for the Aging twice a week. Uh, so I have always been somebody in this community to find where there's a gap and where there's a need and then figure out how to make that need met. And uh, so that's really me in a nutshell. Again, my, my background's varied. I've done taught English as a second language. I've done healthcare work. I've been an education advocate and I'm still the same person. Tell us why did you decide to run for public office? I know, you know, maybe there's a couple of answers to that because you were an elected official before you were a candidate for Congress. Um, were the reasons different running for uh, a local or state office as opposed to running for Congress? Fundamentally, no. Uh, the reasons really were very much the same, and that is that my representative was not doing the job uh, that re really representing people like me. So let, if it's okay, I'll give people a little bit of a background of why I ran for office the first time yeah. and uh, that experience and then where I, I, I am now. So when I was in college, I went to SUNY Potsdam. Uh, I was part of a group that fought a garbage incinerator. The legislator, the legislature, the county legislature was trying to build a garbage incinerator in St. Lawrence County. It would have been a, a boondoggle, but it would have been horrible for the environment. And so for many months, uh, I participated in those meetings, learning about the incinerator. And at the very last meeting, there were so many of us that had an opinion and we wanted to voice our opinion that we did not fit in the county courthouse. So all of the legislators had to come out and address us. And so 
I was outside with all of these people. It just felt so vibrant, so exciting. And as the legislators came out one by one, one of them looked at the crowd and then he turned his back on the crowd. I thought at that moment, you do not deserve to be here. I am going to run for office. <laughs> and I did. 10 years later, I ran uh, to be a St. Lawrence County legislator. I ran in a very Republican district, District 8. Uh, I was in my early 30s. I looked at the board and I said, boy, there are a lot of older men, no <laughs> younger women, no people with young children, really. Um, and nobody with a background in health, in human services, uh, and the work that I was doing in the community. So I knocked on doors. I really ran it with this was in 2002, ran a race where I just wanted to communicate with everyone in that district as best I could to let them know who I was, why I was running and what I wanted to do. And I won. And I served for four years in the minority as a Democrat. I worked very hard to help other folks win and we won, the Democrats won the majority four years later, I was unopposed. Uh, and so I served eight years in the St. Lawrence County Legislature. I finished in 2010. So let's fast forward to 2015. Uh, I never thought I was gonna run for office again. My daughter Ada was diagnosed with something called degenerative disc disease as she lost the ability to walk and to stand and she needed to have emergency back surgery. We were lucky because I had a job and I had insurance. So Ada got the surgery that she needed. A month later, I lost my job. We lost our insurance. Uh, and as you can imagine, that was traumatic for me. Many families face that here. So in 2017, when Elise Stefanik voted to repeal the Affordable Care Act to kick 64,000 people in this district off their insurance and to rip away protections for people with pre-existing conditions like Ada, that was it. I knew I had to run. And so I put my hat in the ring and, and that's why I ran for Congress. Yeah, that's so powerful. And I just think of all the people who have had that experience of having your health coverage tied to your employment and, mm -hmm. and losing that. And especially now in this pandemic, it's just so. I, yeah, I think that experience isn't unique here. Yeah. But that experience would be unique in Washington. And that's, I mean, we can talk about what's been going on in the last several months, but fundamentally, <laughs> I believe what's miss missing in Washington are just people who understand their communities, who aren't there for power or prestige, but who are there for the people in their community so that they, all of us, have a voice. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, I think there are a lot of misconceptions about running for office, you know, what it's really like. I think they're fueled by TV shows in the media. I'm wondering if you can give us a sense of what it was like to run for office, the physical act of doing it. What is it really like? And maybe tell us about what was your best moment on the campaign trail and also what was your worst moment on the trail? First and foremost, it's hard. So I'm just going to put that out there. I think that we sort of glamorize it and we think somehow it's a glamorous thing or it's going to be easier than it is. And you and I both know it is physically taxing. It's emotionally taxing. Yes. Uh, I actually had some problems with insomnia, which yes. I would say is probably the worst. Uh, um, and I did everything. I had, you know, meditation <laughs> things. I listened to books on tape. I, but I think for me, a lot of the processing that I did was in the middle of the night. And that was, that was pretty hard for me. Again, I ran twice. So the second, you know, after I lost in 2018, I didn't, I didn't suffer the same kind of insomnia that I suffered uh, in the first cycle. Partly it was so difficult because at one point there was an 11 way primary. There were so many people that was, that was a lot. And yeah. I was sort of doing everything. I was running the campaign, getting volunteers, following up, trying to raise money. And so I think as the candidate, I was very, um, very taxed, I guess, for lack of a better word. Yeah. But in this second cycle, I think I was really lucky 
to not have a primary and to have a really amazing team. This is, I mean, I had an amazing team all along and so many of the people were, have been with me for four years, right? Um, but the professional staff that I could, um, I could rely on to just carry the decision-making process. That's not to say that as the candidate, I wasn't the final person sometimes to say, I really feel strongly about this. But in the team, I was able to say, what's the wisdom of the group? Professionally, I do strategic planning. I do training with people. And so I've always worked with people and worked with groups in group process in uh, decision making and problem solving. And so I really feel like I was very lucky to have that team, to be able to rely on that team uh, and um, to trust the wisdom of the group. To follow on that, the highest point has got to be all of the volunteers, all of the people that I've met along the way. And even now I'll tell you, I deliver meals and I walked into somebody's uh, apartment to deliver her meal. And uh, it was just after we announced the pack, there was a little uh, a piece on TV. And one of the women, I'd already been delivering meals for several weeks to this person. And she looks at the TV and she looks at me and she looks at, she says, oh, oh, you're Tedra. And I said, <laughs> yes, I'm Tedra. So I think some of it is just that I'm, I'm me in this community, and I think people even now are sort of making the connection. You'd think, wow, after all this time, people would know who I am, <laughs> but they still are learning that, and that's sort of um, a special yeah. gift, I think. Is there anything you know that stands out to you as a particular, particularly hard moment or decision that you had to make while you were campaigning that you thought, wow, this is, I'm going to remember this because this was, this was tough for me personally, physically, you know? Well, I think the toughest thing for me was to live our values in COVID mm. because I'm one of those people who was hoofing it. I called it hoofing it around the district. I was <laughs> everywhere. We, we did really innovative things. I wanted to meet people. Those conversations are so crucial to me and to learning and to the passion that I bring or brought to the campaign and, and hope to bring to Congress. So as a person who has a background in healthcare, I felt like I had to protect all of those volunteers. I had to live my values in terms of keeping people safe. So there were times when people were really, even my volunteers were pressuring me or sometimes other people were pressuring me, you, you have to get out there, you have to have these events. And I thought, what if I have an event and one person gets ill and then I have to, I have to tell everybody that I've put them at risk. So I would say that was really the most difficult thing to, to try to do every other strategy I could to communicate with voters in a time um, that was so difficult. Yeah. I mean, Thank there are you. other things too. There are other policies and things, but I think fundamentally this cycle was just structurally so hard. Yeah, I mean, it's something that we haven't had to face in a hundred plus years, right? And I mean, as a voter, thank you for not putting people at risk because we saw over the last election cycle, what happens when you hold in-person massive events, the death of people like Herman Cain, you know, things that are directly attributable to the Trump camp and, you know, others in the Republican party who wanted to continue to flaunt this pandemic and, and probably in some places made it worse. So, I mean, from me to you, thank you for doing the hard thing in that situation. Well, I think there are two things. One, at the end of the day, you have to look at yourself in the mirror and you have to say, did I do the right thing? Did I live my values? Yeah. And uh, I think that's just really fundamentally the most important thing when you're running for office. And quite frankly, uh, when I was a county legislator, Sometimes I made really tough decisions about funding or about the budget. At the end of the day, people come to you and even if they disagree with how you voted, they know that you have told them, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm gonna live those values. And that's really crucially important. Yeah, that's right. Well, 
want to shift just a little bit um, into the meat of this podcast and really why I started it, which is that every year, something on the order of 80% of everyone who runs for office will lose their election. But we don't talk about how we process that loss as candidates and as people who are part of movements, right? So I wonder if we can start here. Heading into election day, did you think you would win? And regardless, how did you prepare yourself for political judgment day, essentially? So I was looking at the data and who was vo- who was doing early voting, and it looked great. I will tell you, we got out the voters. I was feeling great. Um, Elise Stefanik was very nervous. It was clear she was nervous by interviews. She was even saying, I'm working really hard. So going into election day, I felt really confident uh, because we had really mobilized Democrats. Now, as you probably know, and some of your uh, viewers might not know, this district has traditionally been very purple, uh, but we do have more registered Republicans. We have a lot of registered blanks or independent folks. And I was really hoping that this Obama-Biden district, this fiercely independent district, uh, would continue to be fiercely independent. Unfortunately, election night, those independents really went for Trump uh, and they went Republican all along the line. Uh, So that was disappointing. And and it was a surprise because we had really built up such momentum going into election night. Um, Losing, losing, and I've talked to a lot of candidates about losing, I think there's a grieving process. Uh, And so every every one of us sort of deals with grief in a different way. I'm one of those people who deals with grief physically. Uh, so I have done a lot of walking. Now that it's very cold and snowy, I'm snowshoeing. Uh, you and I have talked about, I got a heavy bag for Christmas. So <laughs> I did a heavy bag. I, my husband got me the bag. My kids got me the wraps and the gloves. And uh, so for me, always sort of processing is a, um, and, and helping me to work my way through things is often through physical activity. Uh, but then there's also, I think for me, sometimes I have to stop myself from reading the news all the time, uh, from being obsessed about the news. Um, I have uh, become very well acquainted with the serenity prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Uh, That was something I would say along the trail, I would meditate along with, and I still do that. There are things along the trail that I could not change. I could not change COVID. I could not change that my opponent lied the commercials were lies. She had a lot of money to do that. I could not control that. And I think sometimes what happens when people lose is they go back and they think, you know, should I have done something differently? I will tell you, I feel confident we ran a tough race. We talked about the Russian bounties on the lives of American soldiers. We talked about the environment. We talked about healthcare and we ran commercials that really, I think, held Elise Stefanik accountable and were really tough and were honest, and yet we lost. And that's that's something that I have to process, but still the question fundamentally is, did we do everything we could? You know, we made millions of phone calls, millions of texts. We mobilized thousands of volunteers uh, and we raised between the two cycles over seven million dollars that's a lot of work and so we i think i we i feel we as a team and as a community and everyone who participated in this race should feel proud of that yeah i'm certainly proud of you and the way that you ran your race um just spot on the way that you talk about it and you know, I normally, you know, I asked Kasim last week in, in my notes is to ask, you know, how do you process loss? But, you know, for you, I wonder, 
did you process the loss differently in 2020 than you did in, in 2018? Was there a difference between how you handled the two? Well, I knew that it might take two cycles. Uh, having run before, have been, having been involved in politics, knowing that this district is so geographically huge, yeah. and then, of course, having the primary in the first cycle. Yeah. So I made that commitment uh, when I ran the first time and I started this whole process. I made the commitment to run a second time. So I think for me, losing in 2018... The only difficulty was just this, the length of the second run, right? The knowing that I had to keep going. How do you rest? How do you balance? How do you have family time, but also you're still running? How do you also balance that, you know, in the winter of 2019, you know, or, or 2018, people were just tired, 2018 into 2019. People are yeah. sort of like, don't we get a break? And on some <laughs> level, yes. And on another level, no. And I'm still sort of, as I start the pack, sort of dealing with that, right? I, yep. We have to be diligent. We have to be persistent. We have to be constantly, there really in so many ways is no rest. It's sort of like handing the baton. We just have to keep handing the baton. And when we need a rest, take a little rest. So, um, so for me, it was that balance. Um, the other thing is I did have to do some work <laughs> financially. <laughs> uh, yeah, we don't really talk about that, but I didn't pay myself in the campaign. Yeah. So uh, in 2019, I actually was able to do some consulting work. Um, and it was really a special time for me because um, I actually was able to do a contract with uh, St. Lawrence Valley Hospice during that time. Um, I cared for my mother uh, with hospice and then I served on the hospice board. So being able to do work with hospice during that, uh, those few months when things were sort of slower was a really special time where I had work, but also I was doing something personally very meaningful. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. Um, you've mentioned your, your pack and you know, I want to ask you this question, which is, you know, I grew up in a very rural uh, place and most of, I think, New York 21 is a very rural district. Do you think it's different for rural candidates like you and me to deal with loss than it is for other candidates who might live in a big city or have glitzy lights around them all the time? Do you think that rural people deal with loss in different ways? And, and maybe how has that manifested itself, you know, for you? That is a really great question. I, I, that, I, I've never really thought about it in terms of losing in a rural place. Uh, I think, well, I think COVID, I mean, one of the things about COVID also that makes it difficult is normally you would, I would be with friends, right? I would be yeah. processing with friends or just I'm an, people don't know this. I'm an introvert. Um, Me I too. Do, Me yeah. too. <laughs> and, and this is an important thing about candidates, actually. It's a really important thing. Yeah. So a lot of people are confused about introversion and extroversion. And I'm yes. going to get, I, I think this will answer the question. Introverts need to be alone to process and to re-energize. Yes. Extroverts need to be with people to re-energize. I'm one of those people, I'm an introvert, but I actually like to be with people, but quiet. In other yes. words, I love to have, I, and I used to, when I taught English as a second language, I would have these big parties with international students and their families. And then, and then but I would always um, be doing the dishes or feeding people. And so I would be quietly listening to conversations. Yeah. That's sort of how I process. It's, a, it's an interesting thing. So to get to your question in a rural place, um, I think, you know, it's not like I can be out there at a restaurant and just be sort of eating and quiet and watching people. Yeah. Um, I, and so that isolation, I think, has been a little bit more difficult. Yeah. But the beauty of living where we live and where I live is, you know, I can walk out my door and walk for hours and snowshoe and, yeah. again, process in nature and and alone, which is for me really important. So it's a funny balance. 
I think the other thing that's always tough about a rural place is sometimes we think everybody knows us mm -hmm. or everybody is going to, I'm going to go to the store and people will be looking at me thinking, oh, that's Tadra, she lost. But <laughs> as I just was telling you about this woman that I'd been delivering meals to for weeks, she figured out finally who I was. Yeah. So I think that when we're really humble, we sort of realize not everybody knows who we are. It's not all about us and our loss. It's just that that's sort of in our head. In a, in a, probably in an urban area, you can walk outside and you think, nobody knows me, I can be incognito. And you feel like you maybe can't be here, but you sort of yeah. also can be. Yeah. I, uh, and I also, can I say one more thing? And yes. the other thing is, it is always a beautiful thing when people come up to you in a rural place and they do recognize you. And they and this does happen to me. And they say, I voted for you. I'm really proud of you. I really wanted you to win. I have that happen to me all the time. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Um, I appreciate this conversation. And I think talking about this, this kind of stuff is important and how we deal with it because, you know, it was it was driven home to us the reason why we have this conversation on January 6th right, with the incidents at the U.S. Capitol. Um, I've talked openly about how it deeply affected me. I wonder if you can talk about how did the insurrection at the Capitol impact you? And what do you think about its aftermath and its impact on our country moving forward? Well, I think first and foremost, horrified. Uh, I, and I, I think that's probably across the board that people felt horrified uh, by what was happening. But the other thing, as I look back and I think about that, that day and that night, I ran against someone who fully supported Trump and who even that night, even after the horrific events of that day, supported this, you know, supported Trump and, and supported um, his lie, the big lie. We now call it the big lie. And she continues uh, in that venue, which actually, if anything, gives me more energy for the pack, gives me more energy and more passion to make sure that we not only replace Elise Stefanik, but all of the other enablers uh, right. that, that caused January 6th to happen. You and I talked about this, you know, in, in recent days, as you look back on the results of your election. You talk to me about the thing that maybe surprised you the most and, and what you think that means for us, you know, in your district as a country, maybe moving forward. I think the what surprised me the most was how many people, even from the last election, went for Trump that this district that had been fiercely independent seemed not to be anymore. And I think I've sort of seen that in the last, again, remember I ran in 2002 and won in a Republican place, was unopposed, which means I did my job in the community. The Republicans didn't put someone up against uh, 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 me in that election. So I really feel like on election night, I had to think about this place that I live in, the place that I chose because it was sort of that libertarian and libertarian means live and let live, not libertarian kind of screw you, I'm gonna get mine yeah. um, and I don't care about you. And so that that has been something I've been thinking about and will continue to process. And, and then of course, what is my role? in the community now. And I don't have the answer to what my role is. Uh, in the short term, delivering meals. In the short term, I mean, certainly the PAC is crucially important to me uh, to help other candidates because this is, let's take a moment and think about this election. Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Arizona, Michigan, Georgia. Biden won because rural Democrats got out the vote. And even though we lost, and New York was going to go blue anyway, but still, I lost. We got out the votes. We mobilized Democrats. And in those swing states, we mobilized de Democrats to win at the top of the ticket for Mark Kelly to be the senator from Arizona. So for me, that PAC, really the mission is to help rural candidates 
who aren't going to get the attention that they will get from the big D Democrats, from the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. And you know what? Their mission is to defend their seats. Their mission is to expand to the places that they can to pick up those seats. So that means that rural districts, candidates in rural areas, they may not get the infrastructure support, the coaching that they need, the mentoring that they need uh, to be successful. And that's where we come in because they deserve it. And because many of them have put their names forward, despite knowing how difficult it may be to win in rural America. But if we don't be relentless, if we are not relentless in running and running good candidates and supporting them, then we're not gonna win at the top of the ticket. And I think if any time, any election proves that, this election proved it. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think, you know, another thing that we focus on as a party, the institution is the importance of fundraising. And I think you and I both know it is very important, right? You need to have money to be able to reach voters, but especially, and the reason that I think Backroads PAC, your PAC is so important is you need to do things outside of, you know, money can't solve all your problems, right? You need to build community in an effort to, maybe you're not persuading people who were rural Republicans or libertarians to register as Democrats and, uh, you know, wave a blue flag, but you need to spend time persuading those folks about you, about being a, a member of the community uh, and building a sense of community, which you and I have talked about before even you decide to run, which I think is what you did very well throughout your career, uh, as you've mentioned. Um, but also in the process of campaigning, it isn't just TV ads and call time and you know finding donors and sending mass emails, right? It is building community through campaigning. And I think that's really helping people do that through your pack is so important. So I'm glad I'm glad you're doing it. Thank you. Uh, the last really question that I have for you, and I'll let you uh, talk about whatever you like in, in response to this is knowing everything that you know, the experiences that you've been through. Would you do it again and would you do anything differently? Firstly, I would absolutely do it again. Uh, I, like I said, I never thought I would run for office again. I thought my political career was over in 2010. Uh, and I really struggled. I knew I wanted to run when Elise Stefanik voted to repeal the Affordable Care Act. Right. But I also am married. Uh, um, and uh, for over 30 years, and my husband is still married to me despite <laughs> running for Congress. Cheers but you know what? <laughs> yeah, that's right. But I had to balance what I really wanted and, and what he wanted and his vision for our life together. Yeah. And it, I have to say, running would not leave me. In other words, I started thinking about it. I kept thinking about it. I said, no. I kept saying no. And then I just said to him, I can't let it go. I will regret not running. Yeah. And that's the important thing. Do I regret running? No. Would I have regretted not running? Yes, I believe I would have. I believe that I had to run because it just wouldn't leave me. Yeah. And so I, I feel really strongly about that. So losing is okay. And that's something we have to say to ourselves. Losing is okay, but was it important? Did we talk about important issues? When I had parents come to me and say, my child has had cancer, they will always have a pre-existing condition. My husband has a blood disorder. He will always have a pre-existing condition. And we almost lost our health care. Every one of those stories is the reason why I ran, is the reason why I'm doing the pack, and um, and is the reason why I absolutely have no regrets. Tedra Cobb, where can folks find you? And then where can they find Backroads Pack uh, on social media? How can they, how can they uh, get involved and get in touch? So I'm Tedra Cobb uh, and Tedra Cobb on Facebook and Twitter and Backroads Pack is Backroads Pack. Uh, so we're pretty easy uh, to find and we're very active. And uh, sometimes my own Twitter, uh, sometimes my own Twitter just has my family stuff. I love to talk about what it's like in rural America. Um, sometimes I talk about our solar panels. 
my electric snowblower, uh, my wackadoodle cute adorable dog, um, and all of those things too. Not just uh, not just politics, but certainly we are doing everything that we can, and and I'm doing everything uh, that uh, I can to continue to put uh, focus on Elise Stefanik until there's another opponent. Uh, she needs to be held accountable, as do all of the people who have enabled Trump. And so we are going to continue to use our social media um, in positive ways uh, on on every front. Yeah. Tedra, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for being open with us and sharing your experiences. I appreciate you and I look forward to your success and what comes next. Well, I thank you and I keep watching what you're going to be doing because it's going to be great no matter what. <laughs> we'll yeah. see, we'll see. All right, Tedra, <laughs> take care. All right, take care, thank you.